Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori, and today I want to do something just a little bit different with my format. So today I'm going to try using StreamYard to do my uh, next chapter of The Absorbent Mind, which is chapter 15. I know this is going to look maybe just a little bit different, so let me know if you like it, let me know if you don't like it. We'll give it a try and see how it goes. With that being said, let's jump into chapter 15 of The Absorbent Mind. So chapter 15 is called Development and Imitation. And this chapter really talks a lot about things that you may know already, a lot of things that if you have a background in education or in child development, early childhood education, uh, you already know probably a lot about imitation. With imitation in Montessori, we want to look at it just a little bit differently. So today we might be covering a topic that you know pretty well, but from a Montessori perspective, you might be challenged to think about it just a little bit differently. So with that being said, let's move to our first quote from the chapter. So my chapter begins on page 141, and Maria Montessori says here that they say that in this period of life, the child begins to imitate. When she's talking about this period of life, she's really talking about that zero to six year old environment. And in this specific spot, she's really talking about one year olds and two year olds specifically right here. And that is the period where we really start to see children imitating adults. And she says, this in itself is no new idea. For children have always been said to imitate their elders. But this was a very superficial way of putting it. Today, one realizes that before he can imitate, the child must first of all understand. The old idea was that all we grown-ups had to do was to behave in our usual ways and the children, by imitation, would grow up to do likewise. This ended our responsibilities. Naturally, we included the idea of setting a good example and stressed the importance of all adults doing this, especially the teachers. On their example depended the good of humanity, and mothers too had to be perfect. But nature does not reason like this. She, referring to nature, is not concerned with the perfection of adults. The important thing is that before the child can imitate, he must be prepared for doing so. And this preparation derives from the efforts he has been making. This is true of every single human being. The example set by adults only provides the aim or motive for imitation. It does not produce a successful result. As a matter of fact, the child, once launched on his attempts, often improves on the example set him. No one can ever become great just by imitation. The example may arouse a hope. It may awaken an interest. The desire to imitate may stimulate effort, but training on a vast scale is needed before the heights can be attained. In the educational field, nature herself teaches that imitation requires preparation. The first efforts the child makes are not aimed at imitating, but at forming in himself the capacity to imitate. They are aimed at changing himself into the thing desired. This shows the universal importance of indirect preparation. Nature gives us not only the power to imitate, but also the power to transform ourselves. And if, as educators, we believe we can help the child's life powers to achieve their ends, then it is important for us to know at what points our help can be usefully given. So let's talk about this real quick. Right here, she's really talking about before we get to imitation, we have to prepare the environment. We have to have this indirect preparation. And so I guess my question would be, what would you consider an indirect preparation for imitation in your environment? Are you in a classroom environment? Are you in a homeschool environment? Are you in childcare? This indirect preparation for imitation is really important. And if I was to give my answer to that, I would say this probably comes a lot in the, in the practical life area. 
And this practical life area is really where the child normalizes or adjusts to the world or, or, or adjusts to the environment. In the practical life area, we give a lot of lessons that are very, very small, but also build on one another. So for instance, we might start with small one-to-one -one pouring. We might start with dry pouring and then move to wet pouring. And we just do those activities in isolation. And those isolated movements are really focused on the control and coordination of movement. So when we perfect that small, simple pouring, it's going to come into play later on as we're building more skills one at a time. So for instance, that small pouring work will go into something like hand washing or scrubbing a table. And then eventually that coordination that we're building, those muscles that we're building will go into things like woodworking or sewing and different skills like that. So we're really talking about giving the children the opportunity to imitate the adult, but also building, building those skills that allow them to imitate an adult. Because if we don't start small with those isolated skills, with that isolation of difficulty, then the child, no matter how much they want to imitate the adult, doesn't have the capability. And that's really what we're talking about right here. And we need to break everything down into these smaller steps when they're, very, when they're very young. And that's what we focus on in Montessori is breaking these things down into smaller steps so that it becomes achievable, so that we're building skills. So um, I actually had a comment, it was over on my Rumble channel when I was doing my gluing video. I put my gluing video out there and I asked one of my classmates, I'm like, how does it look? Does it look all right? And they thought it was a fabulous video. And somebody commented on it and like, I don't see how this is going to work. I just don't see that a child will ever be interested in this. And I thought, you know, and I tried to think of a good response. And I think now that I look back at that, maybe I should have explained a little bit better that a Montessori, when we're giving a very isolated lesson, a lesson that has that isolation of difficulty in it, that's just the first lesson. We're building the skills necessary to become more capable of complex work. We don't want to just stay at that level, right? We want the child to develop a skill and then move on to how do I use this in a more complex situation? How do I use this with more steps? And that's what we're looking at with imitation in this age group as well. And my question to you would be, how can children fulfill their desires to be like the adult without using fantasy or wish fulfillment? In other words, um, let me explain that my background before Montessori is early childhood education. So we had an entire area of the room dedicated to dramatic play, to pretend play. They would pretend to make food, pretend to do woodworking, pretend to be princesses or, or anything like that, right? Pretend to be animals. And in early childhood education, that is very valuable, right? We do value that. That's something that we think is important for this age group. And in Montessori, uh, we think about that differently. We really consider it something very different. And if you go to my video on uh, imagination, it's one of my first videos that I made. I, I will get into this topic more in that video. So if you're curious, go ahead and check out that video. So in Montessori, we have this different view of what imagination is and how it takes part in the zero to six year old age group. And in this age group, we want children to be empowered to do things for themselves. That doesn't mean we give them things to do that they are uh, not ready to do or, they're not, or that they're not capable of doing, but instead of doing pretend play with food, right? Giving them pretend food to play with, we give them real food to take care of. We show them how to, um, we chop cucumbers, we show them how to squeeze a lemon, we show them how to bake bread, we show them how to break an egg and mix it into um, maybe a cake mix. And so we do a lot of food work in the practical life environment and we don't want them to pretend to make food. We want them to really make food. We also want them to really sweep the floors and sweep the table. And when I give a lesson in the practical life area, one of my favorites is scrubbing a table. We're not pretending to scrub a table. We are scrubbing a table and we're building the skills for that. So in Montessori, we very much believe that when a child is imitating an adult, we need to do it in reality. We need to find a way to build those skills if they don't have those skills, right? It's not just here, here's a really hard thing for you to do. Good luck with that. It is, I know how to break this down into a series of small lessons 
so the child can become independent, so the child can become coordinated, so that the child can really bring to life that imitation without wish fulfillment and without fantasy. Now, we do get more into the, the idea of fantasy and imagination in the second plane of development, which is the six to 12 year old environment, and it does look different there. And there, there might be more fantastical ideas and fantastical work, but that's not necessarily what we wanna do in that zero to six year old age group. And if you're interested in that topic, go ahead and check out my video on fantasy versus imagination. Um, it is one of the first videos I made, so go ahead and give that um, a look if you're interested in this topic. Um, but for right now, let's move on to our next set of quotes. So right here she says, the whole of life prepares us indirectly for the future. In all those who have done something of fundamental importance, you will find there has always been a strenuous period in their lives, which preceded the doing of this actual piece of work. It was not necessarily work of the same kind, but there must have been an intense effort made along some line or other. And this acted as a spiritual preparation, provided it was able to exhaust itself fully. The cycle must have been completed. So whatever intelligent activity we chance to witness in a child, even if it seems absurd to us or contrary to our wishes, provided of course that it does him no harm, we must not interfere for the child must always be able to finish the cycle of activity on which his heart is set. If his cycle of activity be interrupted, the results are a deviation of personality, aimlessness, and loss of interest. Let's talk about what she's saying here. So she's talking about this spiritual preparation and this ability for the child to complete a cycle of activity. Unfortunately, these days, a cycle of activity uh, may be finishing your iPad game. That's not the cycle of activity I'm going to suggest for this video. Uh, what she's talking about here is when a child is engaged in a work. Let's say the child is very interested in sorting colors. There's something about it. Let's say a two-year-old, two to three-year-old has all these colors and all of a sudden they've just decided, they've decided that these colors need to be sorted. Or let's say it's a child with a car collection and they're doing something with all of these cars. They're sorting them somehow, they're organizing them, they're, they are organizing them somehow, they're lining them up, they're doing something with it. And maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense to us, maybe it does, maybe we can see, oh, the, they are sorting them by color or by size. Not really sure uh, what they're doing, but maybe they're doing some sort of intelligent activity. They're not being disruptive with it, they're not being disrespectful with the toys, they're not being disrespectful. They're not misusing it. They're not using it to hurt anybody else. They are working with those toys and we may not understand what their goal is, but it's purposeful, right? There's something purposeful going on in it. And that's what we're really talking about here is allowing the child to have that moment where something inside of them has connected with something that they're working with and they are working purposefully without disrupting or disrespecting or using that work to hurt anybody around them. For whatever value it has for the child, we really need to let them explore and finish that cycle of activity. And I think if you're a parent, if you're a teacher who has interrupted a child who's in the middle of something that just seems really, really important and you're not sure why, you you tend to see a consequence of interrupting them, right? There's something you've interrupted. They are, they haven't exhausted their possibilities with this work. And a lot of times that may end up with a temper tantrum, or it may end up if you have a parent that is really, really controlling and always puts off what the child is doing to serve their own purposes or their own schedule, you may have uh, a child who has a very, um, who has no sense of willpower, right? Maybe, maybe they always allow someone else's will to dictate what they do and they can't make decisions for themselves. 
or maybe you have the strong-willed child who fights back at every every single step right uh, depending on your child's personality if you constantly interrupt them and you constantly um, if you don't allow them to finish something that's purposeful to them she says there are de deviations that occur so what can we do are we just going to let them do whatever they want this is something that i hear a lot of in montessori is actually i get two criticisms of montessori and it's really funny because they both contradict each other but the criticism i recently heard is oh montessori they just let the kids do anything they want um so I would say that can be true of any teacher, of any homeschool environment, and that's not really the curriculum. That's not really the theory that's the problem. Uh, that is more of uh, the person in charge of the environment, allowing the child to do whatever they want. In the Montessori environment, we have what's called the prepared environment. We have a collection of works that we've put together intentionally, purposefully in a series so that the child not only develops so that the child not only develops their skills and their personality and their academic and cognitive skills right but they also develop character they developed they they develop their will so for instance letting the child do whatever they want is not a staple of the montessori environment that's not a foundation that's not a theory what we do is we give them a collection of good choices and we do expect them to make choices now a first year student who is two and a half to three years old in the primary environment uh, they may spend a lot of their time observing other children and that is part of that first year child that that two and a half to three and a half year old child is an observer they're absorbing everything but we do want them to work it is very possible for maybe that first year student to spend the year observing mostly and then the second year they come back and they just do everything uh, that does happen uh, but also we do get children who are totally detached from the classroom who spend their time observing that first year and then they come back and they're still detached so we do have those issues too right and so you have to make a judgment call but in Montessori what we want to do is find that work that helps bring that child into the classroom then we we want to find that work that helps normalize them and that is what we're looking for in the first year and usually this is what we're working towards with a first year student and hopefully in that two and a half to three year old age group uh, because when we get them a little bit older it is harder to get them more um, get them more settled in the classroom because they've kind of missed out on this window of opportunity so when we're talking about letting the child do this cycle of activity and find something that interests him he may decide that maybe he doesn't like pouring right he really doesn't like pouring water that's not his thing however maybe he's decided that he really likes baking or he really wants to bake bread so you can use that as a motivation of well i understand you want to make bread but in order to do that i need to see that you're working on your skills on pouring or table scrubbing Right? And so we can bring it back to setting boundaries. We can set some boundaries once we find what motivates the child. Maybe it's not gonna be baking, maybe it's gonna be woodworking, maybe it's gonna be sewing. And in order to motivate them, we need to find out what they're interested in, right? We need to see what is it that somebody has put in front of, in front of them that they want to imitate? What has the adult done in their life, either in the home environment or somewhere else, that's caught their attention? And if I can find out what gets them motivated, I can bring it back to the lessons in the classroom that I want them to, to achieve. And so we do let them pick and choose a lot of their own work, and we do let them pick and choose how they're gonna do it a lot of times, when they're gonna do their work, but not working is not a choice, right? And so we're really talking about that motivation that we're creating in the environment. And we're also talking about cultivating character and willpower for instance not every child can do the same work at the same time so if one child wants to sew and another child has the sewing work out they have to learn to wait right and so this idea that the child can just do whatever they want 
is a misconception in Montessori. And sadly, a lot of Montessori teachers, there are Montessori teachers out there who adhere, who, who have misunderstood the theory and have decided that the children can just do anything. And then you get the other criticism that Montessori is way too militant and it, 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 they just make the children do everything and they're so in control and they don't let them do anything wrong. Uh, and it's, and you know, children in their kindergarten year shouldn't have to be doing uh, division into the millions with racks and tubes. Well, they don't have to, but they can and we're set up for it, right? So if the child's motivated and we have a series of steps leading from, um, leading from numbers one through 10 to division into the millions and the child is capable of it and is motivated to do it, we provide that. So it should be this beautiful balance of understanding the motivation of the child, building those skills separately and allowing the child to be naturally who they are because not every child is gonna love every activity in the classroom. And this is particularly the case with practical life and finding out what motivates the child. And that's really the child we're talking about today is the child who has seen something out in the world that they want to imitate. And we're really, as a teacher, trying to find that, link that to the child, prepare a series of steps that helps them coordinate their movements and also prepares them for academic work and builds the concentration. So that's what we're talking about right here is finding that purposeful work for the child. We want to grow independence with each step, with each skill, right? If the child's interested in woodworking, we're not just going to go give them a chainsaw and uh, say, good luck with that. Cut down that tree and let's see what you make. No, you know, we might start out with helping them uh, screw or unscrew bolts into, um, into a piece of wood. We might have them start sanding, right? Some of my coworkers use a handsaw and they cut cardboard and then eventually they'll go to wood small skills so we do woodworking but we do it on a small scale we prepare the child at each step to move forward to a more complex system of skills so that's what we're talking about right here we also want to make sure you know it's safe it's developmentally appropriate for the child and we really need to focus on how often we interrupt a child's cycle of activity when they are engaged, when they are involved with something, something I think I still struggle with. And it's something that I think our culture just struggles with in general is that we interrupt children a lot more than we should because we don't value what their work is. We don't value what they're trying to accomplish. And if we did understand that a little bit more, if we did have a better understanding of how valuable this cycle of activity is for the child, then we would not interrupt them. <laughs> then we would not interrupt them at all, hopefully. Um, but I still struggle with that. I work in a classroom and I have and I have had to pull myself back from interrupting a child. But even then there are times when I think back on my day and I think, oh, I should have done this differently. I shouldn't have interrupted the child. They were fully engaged with this work and I interrupted them. I interrupted the concentration. I interrupted their ability to finish the cycle of work. And that is what we're talking about in terms of allowing the child to imitate is finding that motivation inspiring the child, breaking it down into small skills so that whatever they're trying to imitate, not only can they imitate that, we're building the skills to imitate it, but we're also giving them to the opportunity to become a master at it, perhaps even more so than the adult. So let's move on to the next series of quotes here. So right here, it says, the adult's usual anxiety is to relieve the child of the weight. But psychologists in these days are convinced that help of this kind, interrupting, as it does, the child's self-chosen activity is one of the most harmful forms of repressive action we can take. The nervous troubles of many difficult children can be traced back to this kind of interference. So let's take a look at that real quick. She's really talking about how anxious we become when children are independently working, when they're doing something on their own. We are in a culture where we do tend to hover and helicopter instead of letting a child work. And to be fair, we have a lot of information 
coming to us nowadays via the internet, via how we get our news, right? Just a collection of information from around the world of every little thing that can go wrong. And when you think about that, and when you think about how overwhelming that is to be a teacher and to be a parent, knowing all the different things that can go wrong, uh, you do tend to become a little bit more paranoid, right? I hear a lot of parents saying, you know, this isn't the same world that I grew up in. Uh, I would never let my children do the things that, that I did as a child, right? There's a lot of parents saying that nowadays. And, you know, I grew up in the 80s. I could ride my bike to the general store and get a candy or a pop or, you know, do something and then ride back home. I don't know if I would allow children to do that nowadays, even in an, in an environment that's pretty safe, just because it's kind of a scary world out there right now. We're all kind of living in a little bit of fear. And so when parents are a little bit more nervous about, about allowing their child to have some more freedom to develop, it's also got to be balanced out with, well, what is the context, right? What are we doing here? But when it comes to difficult children, which if you're in the classroom right now, if you are teaching, um, there's a lot of that going on and it feels like it, it, it's growing every year, this difficult children. So let's talk about difficult children real quick with what she is saying here. Now, difficult children, let's think about the context. We're talking about imitation and we're talking about development and we're talking about adults who have anxiety that want to relieve the child of whatever weight they're carrying, of whatever activity that they're doing. And also in the midst of that, interrupting something that's valuable. Let's say that the child, for some reason, has a need to move these really heavy basket of books from one side of the room to the other. Now for you, you're like, well, they're just moving a bunch of books. It's not valuable. It's not something that is gonna make a big difference. However, if you're thinking about this in terms of development as a cycle of activity that the child is going through, uh, we know in Montessori that there is a window of opportunity to refine movement. And we have this sensitive period in the zero to six age group to refine movement. And once that window of opportunity to refine movement has closed around the age of six years old, sometime between that zero to six age group, it doesn't come again. And so if we don't practice that in that age group at, at the time that our development says this is an important thing for you to refine, um, it becomes harder. And so we need to also understand that if a child is picking up heavy things and has that need to pick up heavy things, perhaps there is a refinement of movement going on. Perhaps that's a sensitive period for the child and that that work is very valuable, right? And so we have to understand that this work has to be purposeful and it has to be connected with what we know about development. So when we have parents who say, okay, this isn't valuable, I'm just gonna do this for you, or I'm just gonna move the books, or don't do anything that might make a mess in the living room, right? If you have teachers that never let children make a mess, even though part of the lesson should be that they clean it up, uh, then they don't actually get to do the work, right? They're not doing anything that develops their muscles. They're not doing anything that develops their coordination because the, the adult has already decided, I'm gonna relieve them of that burden. I'm going to relieve them of their work. I want their life to be easier or I want my life to be easier for some reason or another. So we have this idea that maybe the parents are indulging the child too much, right? Or maybe the parents are helicoptering over their children too much. And maybe the children aren't finding the purposeful work that that their development says they need to have in order to grow and accomplish uh, new skills and new ideas. And so if we miss out on that, then the children become deviated, right? They become difficult. They have a lack of interest in the world because we have taken pieces of the world away from them. We give them iPads because it's easy, right? It's a pacifier. We give them iPads because you know, it doesn't make a mess. Um, and we have all of our reasons for why we do the things we do and why it's convenient and why we just need the children to do this or that in, in our context instead of 
really thinking about what the child needs. And so when we're looking at this, we can see children who maybe who are maybe being served too much instead of, of giving work to do that builds skill and independence. Are we giving them purposeful work that builds skills at every step that allows them to become more and more independent? I'll say right now that I'm seeing a lot of children who can't even hold a pencil. They need to go to occupational therapy just to hold a pencil. And is that really what we want, right? Because they're spending so much time on an iPad doing this and not developing the pincer grip. And so we really need to think about when we're letting children develop skills and how we're letting them develop skills. So the parent may be a hard worker. The parent may be a very hard worker. The parent may set an amazing example for their child, right? They may inspire the child to do great things, but if the parent is always doing the work for the child, if the parent is always giving the child the easy way out, if the parent is not letting the child experience work of their own that's valuable to their development, may not be valuable to the adult, but it's valuable to the child's development, how does this affect their development, right? How does this affect their ability later on in life. If we don't start developing skills in that zero to six environment, when do we start developing skills? And when do we start bringing those skills into focus as far as a career? And we have to really think about when is the most opportune time for the child to start developing skills that allow them to imitate adults. So Maria Montessori goes on to say, this kind of activity, which serves no external purpose, gives children the practice they need for coordinating their movements. It is the possession of coordinated movements, which she says movements in which many muscles have to cooperate, that enables the child to imitate actions of ours. The ostensible aim of the child's work is not its ultimate purpose. All the child does is to obey an inner impulse. It is only after he is prepared that he can imitate adults. Only then can his surroundings inspire him. If he sees someone sweeping the floor or making pastry, he is now able to join in. The new idea can stimulate a successful action. The instinct to move about, to pass from one discovery to another, is a part of their nature. And it must also form a part of their education. To the educator, the child who goes for a walk is an explorer. The idea of exploration or scouting, which is used today as a kind of relief or change from the schoolwork, ought to be a regular part of education and come much earlier in life. So. We would call these field trips, right? This experience outside of the classroom. And she said, you know, this really ought to be something that we do more often. And of course, a lot of us, uh, when I first started in early childhood education, we went for a lot of field trips. And, you know, I really saw that dwindle down over time, long before, before the pandemic came along. And it really just became inconvenient. There were too many risks, too much red tape. Uh, just too much to allow a child to go on a field trip anymore. And so we haven't done that really in the primary age group for a lot of places. And of course, since COVID, uh, it, it was non-existent during COVID, right? We were lucky if we could even be open to educate children during COVID. And so this idea of going out into the world to, to allow the child to be inspired by what they see about them, to be motivated by what they see about them, has really been taken away from them lately. And I guess my question is, you know, is education today, and, and of course I'm thinking in my culture, right? I know there are probably people watching this from a different country but in my country, you know, I, I have to ask, is education today a place for exploration? This idea of exploration, is it something that starts with the child, that starts internally and works outward? Is that a thing that exists in our education? And if you say yes, you know, in what context? 
And in what age group? Is that true for all age groups? Uh, and of course, if you say no, um, you know, what, what, has con what has contributed to that, I guess, is my question. If you say that it, it's not a place for exploration. I know there's a lot of people who want to homeschool so that their children can go out in the world and do things. Because in school, you're just sitting in a room looking at books, thinking about someday I, I will gain a skill. Well, you know, in Montessori, we want to start gaining our skills. First of all, during that sensitive period, right? The sensitive period for refining movement, we want to gain that, those isolated skills the, in, in an isolation of difficulty, right? One small step at a time. And then we really want the child to use those skills to start exploring the world outside of the classroom. And this is true, not of just of the homeschool environment, but that should be what the second plane of development in Montessori is all about as well. They should start going outside of the classroom more. That should be a, a foundation for that, those six-year-olds to 12-year-olds. And then in the third plane of development, which are 12-year-olds to 18-year-olds in Montessori, we believe very much that is a time when children should be gaining their skills. They should be doing apprenticeships. They should be doing what we call an air kinder. And this is some, something that I think a lot of people are on board with in the United States, and a lot of people are not on board with in the United States. And it feels like just from speaking for my generation, when we go ahead and think about what career we want to do, we don't really start practicing those skills for that career until maybe sometimes in your master's degree. It keeps getting delayed. It keeps getting postponed. And when you think about it, uh, you know, the ideal time to start collecting those skills, to refine those skills, is much, much younger than we currently understand it to be. So Montessori really focuses on looking at what's out there, right? That idea of imitation, imitating those that inspire us, which is very much part of the first plane of development, that zero to six year old age group, and also the third plane of development, which is the 12 to 18 year old age group. Those two planes mirror each other in a lot of respects. And then that second plane, they're, they're a little bit different in the second plane, but that first plane and the third plane, that imitation, finding people that inspire you and and wanting to be like them, that exists very much in that, that younger group and that 12 to 18 year old group. And so it really becomes important in that 12 to 18 year old, that 12 to 18 year old group that we're developing apprenticeships and skills-based training. Even if they say, I wanna be a surgeon and they're gonna to have to go through a lot more school and a lot more training, what skills do they need to build in their hands? to become a surgeon, right? What kind of coordination do they need? Because you don't have to wait to be a surgeon to develop coordination, to develop the muscles in your hand. In a Montessori, we want to develop the muscles in your hand, let's say for sewing, in that zero to six year old age group. In toddler AMI Montessori toddler rooms, they are sewing. They're working on threading a needle. It's very, very simple, but they're working on it. And then we make it a little more complex. And then when they get into that six-year-old to 12-year-old age group, we're putting it in a, in a new context. Maybe they're sewing as a part of a play. You know, maybe they're going to present one of the great stories in Montessori. And in order to do that, they have to use those skills they acquired in the primary environment to, to do something that appeals to them, like performance. Or maybe it's engineering, right? Either way, we need those skills. We need to build those muscles. And maybe we have a child that would have made a great surgeon someday, but because they spent all their time on an iPad instead of developing the hand, they have no strength in their hand, right? And we can change that by building those skills, starting very small, very incremental in the zero to six age group. This is gonna be our ending quote right here. And I love 
this quote because I really feel like this is where we are in education right now. This is where, well, this is where we need to be in education right now. And she says, it is not a good thing to cut life in two, using the limbs for games and the head for books. Life should be a single whole, especially in the earliest years, when the child is forming himself in accordance with the laws of his growth. And I think we all know that. I think we don't understand what it means to work that out in education, but I think we know that it is not a good thing to cut life in two. But that's exactly what we've done, right? We keep putting off the application of skill until much later in life. We keep pushing the academic part of it and we don't allow the child to experience the reality of what's going on academically, cognitively. For instance, let's say we're doing an air kinder, which is a farm school or an apprenticeship, right? Let's say that that 12 year old to 18 year old age group is taking one of these air kinder ideas, skills-based training ideas for high school. And so let's say they're learning geometry. They're learning about constructive triangles, which in the Montessori environment, if you're starting in the primary environment, we have an entire uh, work on our shelves, several works on our shelves, all about constructive triangles, that they're, they are getting the sensorial impression of geometry on those shelves. So it's there already, but now we're gonna learn it formally in the older age groups. We're gonna start learning that formally in that 12 year old to 18 year old age group. Well, if they have an apprenticeship, if they're working at an air kinder or a farm school, uh, what would be a good application of geometry? How would you incorporate geometry into education in that type of, of an environment? And one of the best ways to do that is construction work, right? Try building stairs without understanding a triangle. It doesn't work very well. You have to understand the constructive properties of a triangle. You have to understand the mathematics of a triangle. And so if you have an air kinder and you need to be, build stairs, let's say you're building a chicken coop, right? Maybe that's one of the projects that you need to make in your, in your high school experience at your air kinder, at your apprenticeship. You're interested in woodworking. Maybe another child is interested in accounting but they're not just filling out um, a book based on uh, hypothetical questions. You know, in Montessori, in that 12 to 18 year old age group, we're act we are actually running a business. We have to know how much we've sold. We have to know, for instance, if you are running a farm school and you're selling eggs, you know, do you need to reorder egg cartons? How much is that gonna cost? How much are you gonna charge for it? Has inflation, hit that we need to up the price of the eggs, right? All these things are things that high schoolers can do. All, the, all of these things are things that middle schoolers can do. They can start building projects, right? They can do a lot of the skills that are needed in running a business. And because a farm school can offer so many outlets for skills, it's really, I think that's one of the reasons why Maria Montessori chose that as her idea for, for what we're getting into. So even if your desire in life is not to become a farmer, there's still a lot that working at a, a place like a farm school or something like that can teach you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of outlets. It turns out farmers kind of have to be good at everything. You, you've got a lot of things you need to be good at to run a farm. So that is just part of what she's talking about in this chapter and how it applies. We really want to think about application of skill and how that starts because we can't imitate somebody until we build those skills. And if we're constantly putting off that skill part, if we're trying to help children understand what they're learning, but we're not giving them application, then it's not very purposeful. And if you give them geometry and you tell them, all right, now we're gonna build some stairs. We've gotta figure out the triangle and we have to do it according to code. So we gotta figure out what the code says. We have to make these stairs if we wanna go a certain distance, right? We have to follow the, co the code for building. And so we gotta do some math here. We gotta start building things. And so suddenly 
the skills that we're learning don't seem useless. Like, why am I learning this? That's a question I remember asking a lot in high school. Well, you don't have to ask that question if you're applying your skills, if you're applying skills to what you're learning. All of that becomes purposeful and you will remember it better and you'll be more employable once you get out of high school. And that should really be a goal of ours, to be employable. You know, intelligent, well, that's nice, right? But intelligent with the ability to apply skills, now that's valuable. And I don't wanna speak down about going on to college and getting a, a degree. I have a master's degree, I love learning. Uh, if I could, I'd probably collect a whole lot more just because I really enjoy learning. That's just something I like. There are people who like it. There are people who don't like it. That's great, right? But we should be making people more employable. And I would even go so far to say when it comes to teaching, you know, we even see this element in teaching a lot where you go through college and you come out of it with a teaching degree and you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> you get to your first classroom or you get to your teaching internship you're, and you get to your teaching internship and you realize, I hate this. This isn't what I want to do with my life. Why did I spend the last four years doing this, right? Or you get into your first classroom and you're like, wait, I have no idea. Like, how do I just, how do I structure behavior? How do I implement a behavior system in this classroom? How do I work with these difficult kids? In what order do I implement a reading curriculum, right? These are things that they don't necessarily teach in the university. However, all the skills that I have learned that have helped me have come outside of the university system. Master's degree is a little bit different. My master's degree was different, because, but that's partly because Montessori is a skills-based training. I went there two summers, I learned the skills, I learned specifically what I needed to do, what the order was, what the purpose was, and what age is uh, typical for the, each work that the child did. And I learned the theory behind it. So that was very skills-based. Orton Gillingham is another training I received that I absolutely loved because it was skills-based. I, I had a system for going through exactly what I needed to do and how I needed to present it in what order. I wasn't guessing. I wasn't making things up from week to week, which is what I felt like before. Before I got a skills-based teacher training, I felt like I was drowning. I didn't know what I was doing. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about right here is not just having this empty vacuum of learning, of learning for the sake of learning, but learning with the idea of application in mind. And we can learn all these great things that are our theory that don't have an application, but we're better off when we learn it in context with application when we know how to implement what we're learning. So it's something that I would like to see a lot more of in the university system, or I would like to see actually more apprenticeships. I would like to see Montessori available to people who don't have a, mo a master's degree or who don't have a bachelor's degree, because I really feel like an application of, of how to teach is really important. Um, and it's something that I'm amazed that we don't do more of, right? You spend a lot of your time as an educator going to get other certifications and other training once you finish because you realize you don't really know what you're doing. And then you get a training, you're like, well, why didn't they teach me that in college? That would have been actually useful. Uh, and so you spend a lot of your time getting the real application outside of the academic university system. So that's what we're kind of talking about as far as growing the skills. That's what we're talking about as far as growing the skills for, for learning, for imitating, and then hopefully mastering and surpassing those who came before as well, right? We're going to build on what they've done, what they've learned, what they have, have shown us then we wanna do something new with it. And that's where I think we need to go with this idea of education. It's something that Montessori, well, it's something that Montessori should support, right? In Montessori, we really want to focus on purposeful work. And that's not just important to adults. You know, I know how important it is for people to feel valued and to have a career that's valuable. 
but that's important for children too. Breaking down all of those, those movements, those achievable goals and then putting them together to make a bigger goal, to make a bigger application of skill is really what we're talking about here. Empowering children to not only be able to to do what we're doing, to thrive, to see what we're doing, but to master it and go beyond it. That's what we're talking about right here. So anyways, I hope that you have enjoyed this. I hope you like this. It's a very short chapter. So I didn't put everything in here. If you want to go and read the chapter for yourself, it's a very short chapter. So I would encourage you to go back to chapter 15 in The Absorbent Mind and give it a read. There's a lot more there. But I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope that this has inspired you to think a little bit differently about this idea of imitation and how we create and how we create a practical application of skills in the zero to six environment, but also hopefully in the older environment. I know I'm not trained with the older children. I've had some experience um, with it. I've had some experience with the air kinder school. So if you have questions about that, feel free to put the, the questions and comments down below and I'll make sure to, to answer them. Um, but I hope this has just inspired you to think that we could maybe do things a little bit differently, that, that maybe a skills-based ed education in high school really would be really valuable in context of learning academic skills as well. Uh, I think if you go through a cost-benefit analysis of, of what it would look like to do a skills-based training versus just academic, uh, I think that you will come up with a longer list with, with the pro skills-based, right? There are not a lot of cons. Matter of fact, I really can't think of any, if you're thinking of pros and cons on um, a cost-benefit analysis, there really aren't any cons, right? The only thing I could come up with is, well, maybe you wouldn't get to learn as many topics, but maybe not all the topics are useful <laughs> that we're learning in high school. So that's something to think about as well. Um, but I think in terms of math and in terms of literature, in terms of skills of accounting, engineering, mechanics, you know, um, all of those things, biology, all that stuff can be done in a in an apprenticeship or in a air kinder type of environment. So anyways, I have talked for far too long on this video, but I hope you've enjoyed it. And don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you in the next video.